America's southern border wall, a giant in the desert. When most people hear the phrase, the wall, their first thought isn't ancient castles or the Great Wall of China anymore. It's something far more modern, far more controversial, and far more sandy. America's southern border wall, one of the most talked about, argued about, analyzed, criticized, and defended structures of the 21st century. A wall built across deserts, across mountains that looked like they were designed to break construction equipment, and across an international border that has been politically tense for more than a century. But here's the strange part. For all the shouting, headlines, and late-night jokes, very few people actually know how the wall was built, what it's made of, why it looks the way it does, why the original concrete wall idea was abandoned, or how a construction crew even digs a straight trench through land that's either softer than powdered sugar or harder than cured concrete. Today we're going to peel back the steel, sand, cement, politics and engineering behind the southern border wall. Because whether you love it, hate it, or just wonder why it became such a massive topic, the story of how it was built is one of the most fascinating pieces in, well, the history of everyday things. Before we dive in, hit like and subscribe so you don't miss more stories that break down the things we take for granted. Trust me, everything has a history, and it's usually more surprising than it looks. Let's start at the beginning. The idea of a border wall, a promise, a symbol, and a lot of steel. When Donald Trump ran for president in 2016, he didn't just talk about immigration. He turned a border wall into a symbol, almost a character in the story. He promised a massive, strong, beautiful wall stretching across the US-Mexico border. The idea instantly became a political spark. Supporters cheered it, critics attacked it. The media couldn't stop talking about it. But here's the twist most people don't realize. The wall didn't begin with Trump. The United States has been building barriers along the southern border since the 1990s. Under President Bill Clinton, the first serious fences went up. Steel mesh, chain link, things you could climb if you had a basic sense of balance. George W. Bush expanded the fencing during the mid-2000s. Barack Obama reinforced it and added more miles. But they were all small, modest, a few meters tall, more like a tough fence than an actual wall. Then came Trump's proposal, a giant solid concrete wall, a monolith. But that idea didn't last long. The Department of Homeland Security looked at the blueprint and basically said, cool idea, but no. A concrete wall meant border patrol agents couldn't see what was happening on the other side, which is sort of important if your job involves monitoring what's on the other side. So the design changed. Engineers switched to tall, thick steel posts, known as bollards, placed side by side, strong, tall, see-through, less medieval castle, more industrial fortress, these steel bollards became the core of the new border wall. But building them, that's where the story gets wild. A 3,200 kilometer engineering puzzle. The US-Mexico border stretches roughly 1,130 miles, about 3,100 kilometers. Not across smooth grass or friendly farmland, but across some of the weirdest, toughest, and most unpredictable terrain in North America. Imagine trying to build a perfect, straight, vertical barrier across. Sand that blows away with a strong sneeze. Clay that holds water like a soggy kitchen sponge. Riverbanks that flood without warning. Mountains made of bedrock so hard you could skate on it. Building a wall here isn't like building a house, it's like building 1,000 different structures, each one customized to the soil, 
the weather, the climate and the geography around it. Before a single steel post could be installed, engineers had to spend months surveying the land. They drilled soil samples. They mapped elevation. They measured rock hardness. They checked flood risk. They studied erosion. They analyzed wind loads. Because desert winds don't just breeze, they attack. Think about this. Before the wall even existed on the surface, it had to exist underground perfectly planned, meter by meter. Once engineers knew what they were dealing with, the real work began. Digging the trenches, the hardest part comes first. If you want a 30-foot steel wall not to fall over like a domino, you need a foundation deep enough to hold it in place. That meant digging trenches. Around 24, 32 inches wide, about 6, 10 feet deep. Along hundreds of miles, sounds simple on paper. But then you meet the desert. In soft regions, excavators could dig easily. But in rocky terrain, think New Mexico, Arizona, parts of California, digging becomes a battle. Excavators hit granite, shale, sedimentary rock. It's like trying to dig through a countertop. So construction crews brought out hydraulic rock breakers. These giant machines use enormous hammers mounted on excavators to pound the ground until the rock finally breaks into chunks. The vibration rattles through the desert like someone trying to punch their way into the earth's crust. But the real MVP of trench digging was the trencher. Imagine a chainsaw the size of your car, diesel-powered, 250 to 400 horsepower, metal teeth spinning fast enough to chew through solid earth. A good trencher can carve hundreds of meters of straight, even trench per day. Clean, sharp, ready for concrete. Trencher operators often say the hardest part isn't the work, but keeping the machine straight. It's like using a giant razor blade, one operator joked, except the ground fights back. Once the trench was dug and cleaned, it was time for step three, the wall skeleton. The reinforced base, the wall's hidden spine. Before any steel panels were installed, workers dropped in long rebar cages. These weren't small cages. These were steel frameworks stretching the length of the trench. Vertical posts, horizontal ties, all connected to distribute force. Then came concrete. Workers poured a smooth slab about four to eight inches thick on top of the rebar. This slab became the stable platform on which the steel bollards would stand. Think of this concrete slab as the wall's spine. You never see it once the wall is up, but without it, the entire structure would wobble, twist or sink over time. Wind alone could bend or shift the posts, but with the slab, the wall became a continuous, rock-solid base stretching across the desert. Now the wall was ready for the big moment, the vertical panels, steel bollards, the tall, hollow, unshakable soldiers. The steel posts used in the border wall are massive, roughly 30 feet, 9 meters tall, hollow inside to reduce weight. Walls 10 millimeters thick. These posts can weigh 250 to 400 kilograms each. That means each one weighs as much as a grand piano. Transporting thousands of these across deserts and mountain roads required fleets of heavy-duty trucks. Once they arrived, cranes unloaded them carefully. Because one wrong move, one cracked post, and you're looking at thousands of dollars gone. But instead of installing each post one at a time, far too slow, workers welded them into panels, typically four to six bollards per panel. This might sound simple, but welding these panels requires micrometer level precision. Imagine trying to line up several nine meter tall steel posts perfectly straight. One tiny mistake at the base becomes a huge tilt at the top. And when your wall stretches for hundreds of miles, that small error becomes a giant headache. Once welded, the panels sat waiting for the cranes. 
and the cranes had a job that wasn't for the faint of heart. Lifting and aligning, the make or break moment. A 30-foot steel panel is basically a giant metal sail. If the wind blows hard enough, and trust me, desert winds love showing off, it can start swaying like it wants to audition for a disaster movie. Workers used guide ropes to control each panel as the crane lifted it. Slowly, carefully, the crane lowered the panel into the trench. Engineers checked everything with. Laser levels, spirit levels, tension lines, experience and intuition earned from hundreds of installs. Even a tiny tilt could cause the next panel to misalign. And the next. And the next. Before long, your wall wouldn't look like a wall. It would look like a drunk centipede. Once aligned perfectly, workers temporarily welded the panel to small steel anchors in the trench, holding it steady until the concrete arrived. And the concrete was the part that truly locked everything into place. The concrete pour, the final anchor. Concrete mixer trucks backed up to the trench. Workers guided the flow using hoses, making sure the concrete filled every gap around the base of the panel. Air pockets, not allowed. Loose soil, not allowed. Everything had to bond perfectly. Workers used vibrating rods to eliminate trapped air and help the concrete hug every corner of the steel. When it hardened, the steel panel became part of a single unbroken concrete anchor. In soft soil or areas with a history of flooding, crews poured a wider concrete pad extending three to five feet outward. This prevented the soil from shifting and made tunneling far more difficult. If you want to dig underneath the wall, you don't just hit dirt, you hit a reinforced concrete mini fortress. At this point, the steel was up, but the wall wasn't done yet. Cleaning and coating. The wall gets its armour. Before painting, workers blasted every panel with high-pressure water jets. They removed slag, oil, dust, sand and metal fragments. Anything left behind could weaken the paint, and in the desert, paint isn't aesthetic. It's survival. Once it was clean, layers of anti-corrosion coating were applied. Without this, the steel would rust quickly, especially in salty river zones or areas exposed to blowing sand. Only once the coating cured could the wall receive its final feature. The razor wire crown. This part wasn't installed by construction crews, it was installed by military units or border patrol. Razor wire is extremely dangerous to handle. Each coil is packed with blade-like edges designed to cut instantly. Special crews lifted coils to the top of the wall and secured them tightly with brackets. In some areas, more than one layer was added. The result? A barrier extremely difficult to climb safely. Climbing the wall without equipment doesn't just hurt, it's genuinely dangerous. Razor wire doesn't negotiate the costs, the miles, and the reality. Over the years, hundreds of miles of new wall sections and replacement sections have been built. The total cost? More than $15 billion so far, including steel, concrete, labor, transport, surveillance equipment, roads, maintenance. But here's a key point. The wall isn't perfect. It slows crossings, but doesn't stop them entirely. Some groups use ladders, some cut through, some tunnel under in weak areas, and the environmental impact remains controversial, affecting wildlife migration, water flow, and fragile ecosystems. Still, for Border Patrol, the wall isn't meant to be impenetrable. It's meant to slow people down long enough for agents to respond, which raises the real question. What do you think? Should walls be bigger, smarter, or replaced entirely with technology? Drop your thoughts in the comments. This topic gets everyone talking. Conclusion. What the wall really represents. 
When you strip away the politics, the shouting and the campaign slogans, America's southern border wall becomes something else. A massive human project built from steel, concrete, sweat, planning, engineering and decades of evolving ideas. It exists because people disagree. It exists because countries are complex. It exists because borders are complicated places. And it exists because nations throughout history have always used walls to represent their fears, hopes and priorities. You can stand next to the border wall and see steel stretching beyond the horizon. But what you're really seeing is a story, one made of decisions, votes, arguments, blueprints and thousands of workers who spent years building something that millions argue about every day. That's why it belongs here, on the history of everyday things. Because even a wall has a history. And in this case, it's one of the biggest stories ever built. If you enjoyed this deep dive, hit like, subscribe, and tap the bell so you don't miss the next episode. And remember, keep your curiosity standing tall before it gets buried in the sand.